Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Raphael Roca, and I'm responsible for partnerships within EQS, covering the UK, Dutch, and Irish market. So I will be moderating this event, uncovering the key to whistleblowing success and understanding the impact of culture. So during the next hour or so, our guests will shine a light on the impact of culture on the effectiveness of a whistleblowing program. So our guest speakers include Julia Arbery, a partner at Stoneturn, Philip Josebski, who's the Senior Manager of Corporate Investigations and Intelligence at Three, and Professor Chris Meegan, who is a Professor of Interdisciplinary Applied Ethics at the University of Leeds. Morning. So we're gonna start out um, as a, a short overview of EQS, for those of you who aren't familiar with us. I'm then gonna pass over to Julia, who will set the scene of the purpose behind this event and then move into the primary discussion so the ethical issues of speaking up in the workplace and why organizations need a whistleblowing um, solution so before we get into this just a bit of housekeeping on the webinar panel you'll notice the q a box at the bottom so please do use this to submit any questions you may have and we'll cover this at the end of the event there's also a resources section, which you can use to download some materials and register for other events that we have planned. We are going to be sharing the slide deck following the event, as well as the recording. So feel free to share amongst your um, organization. Perfect, so <clears throat> let's get started. So for those of you who are not familiar with EQS, we are an international cloud service provider. We're headquartered in Germany and listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. We now have more than 600 employees worldwide. And through our range of investor relations and compliance solutions, we support more than 8,000 um, organizations worldwide. I wanted to briefly highlight um, the sort of number of solutions that we can facilitate. So a few of the key attributes that we have and modules are around managing policies. So that's the policy manager. We also have approval manager for workflow processes around gift and entertainment requests or conflict of interest, risk management module, as well as our flagship product integrity line, which is our digital whistleblowing software. And due to the element of this webinar, I wanted to give a brief high level overview of this. So integrity line is a highly scalable user friendly digital whistleblowing system that is used by companies ranging from a small handful of employees right the way up to the tens of thousands. So this system is designed with the highest standards of security, fully um, confidentiality uh, protection and anonymity, where relevant is guaranteed from a technical perspective. We also ensure the highest level of IT security and data protection to ensure that we are fully GDPR compliant. So all of this is backed up by the numerous certifications that we have, and you can find out more about these on our website. So if you are looking for guidance around this topic, please feel free to download our free guide, which you can find in the resources section. Perfect, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to Julia, who will cover the objectives of this discussion and set the scene as to why this is important. So thank you, Julia, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Raf. That's very kind of you. Um, hold on, now I pressed something. Turned back. Okay. Um, trying to move on the slides. There we go. <laughs> Let me go at the beginning. Setting the scene. Um, so Chris and I are going to be focusing a bit more on uncovering the key to whistleblowing success and understanding the impact of the culture uh, and why that is so important. I know that. Um, for the past two years now in Europe, we've been talking a lot about um, whistleblowing and the European directive and how it's being very slowly and reluctantly being implemented into um, legislation in the member states. Also in the UK, I understand that earlier this year, the economic, economic crime and corporate transparency bill has been discussed, where though it's unlikely that um, there will be a central whistleblowing office introduced, there still is the failure to prevent um, uh, crime as a possible offense for organization to consider where, of course, effective whistleblowing programs are going to be central and very important in order to build a defense. But 
Chris and I really did not want to look at um, the regulatory framework, but really more around the, the cultural and ethical discussions around it um, and how those, this is linked in order to make it effective. Um, before I introduce Chris in a, in a bit more detail and tell you about his background, which is very, very, very interesting and impressive, we have a poll question that we wanted to ask you um, in order to understand at what level everyone is in the organ is in their um, their journey around whistleblowing. So if you could let us know, do you think your organizational culture makes it easy or facilitates speaking up? That would be extremely helpful if you respond yes, no, you don't know, or it's not, this question's not applicable, you're not sure, um, that would be helpful for us. So I can see that six of um, 130 have submitted answers. We now have 18 who have answered to the poll. I'll give it a few more seconds for everyone to get there. I know that we have one very eager participant who even before the beginning of the webinar already put in a question around what is the relationship between whistleblowing and culture of an organization. Um, so while we, Chris and I are going to be touching on these topics, I can say that in my career, I have worked for a number of organizations, both in-house um, as well as a, a, a consultant with Stone Turn um, around remediating severe cultural issues and um, changing the culture in an organization. And in that regard, it's very important to, to have an environment where employees are feeling and able to speak up, but it's just as important for the leaders of that organization to listen um, and to understand when an employee is speaking up and there's something that maybe needs to be then handled by the right um, part of the organization to look into if there is an issue or not. So we have now um, 64 of the attendees have participated in the poll. Um, I'll give, I think we can probably um, publish the results. So we see that 73% of those that have participated in the poll, in the poll do believe um, that the organization makes it easy or facilitates speaking up. So that's fantastic. Um, we'll see at the end of the session if everyone still is on that same page. There's only a small, uh, very, very tiny um, publication popul that say that it's not applicable at all. But the more majority of you feel very comfortable with the, the cultural aspect of your organization. So I'm very pleased to have Chris with me here today. Chris, I, I don't know if you will already put your camera on so that our participants get to see you while I introduce you. Yes, I've got it on, uh, Julia. So, okay, uh, perfect. Yeah. Um, so Chris is a professor and also the founder of the Interdisciplinary Applied Ethics at the University of Leeds. Um, Chris, you initially started uh, your journey at Leeds in, 90, in the early 1990s um, and have had huge success there with your, with your um, Interdisciplinary Applied Ethics Institute. Um, you initially started out studying classics at Oxford um, and then ventured into philosophy, which I think we'll also be talking about a bit more on how important that element is with your focus area of applied ethics, specifically around medical ethics, business ethics, um, and professional ethics. Um, you and I yesterday got to know each other a little bit better and we're talking about how important it is also to get credibility with the professionals and in the organizations. Um, so not so much be talking to them as the philosopher, but also getting the business involved, the engineers, the professionals, the, the, the um, experts to make it really work, which is why the interdisciplinary element is so important. Um, one of the first questions that you and I are going to be looking at or that we're discussing is really, you know, how is it, how do you create a climate of voice that fosters integrity and trust? Uh, what does the term whistleblowing mean to you? Thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction, Julia. Yes, and uh, as you say, 
uh, from my perspective, it's very important to have a genuinely, genuinely interdisciplinary perspective on these things. And in this seminar, I see you as with a legal background and, and Phil, um, <clears throat> who follows up uh, as providing that necessary interdisciplinary perspective. My background is very much in philosophy and ethics. Um, obviously, I work in a large organization, University of Leeds, where speaking up and whistleblowing might apply to the organization itself, but otherwise, <clears throat> uh, I don't have direct experience of whistleblowing and speaking up in organizations. So what does whistleblowing mean? Well, um, obviously, there is an element of terminology here, but I think about speaking up and whistleblowing as on a conti continuum with whistleblowing seen as the final resort or towards the towards the far one end of that continuum. So if we think about speaking up, then that can take various forms within the organization. But broadly speaking, it's when an employee raises an issue within the organization about some illegal or immoral or unethical activity or an activity that's contrary to the stated values, purposes or ethical code of the organization which the employee feels needs urgently addressing. And obviously that can be done in the first instance with the employee raising it with their line manager. They might escalate that or they might feel it's more, they might actually have a concern about the line manager so need to speak above the line manager, perhaps to a more senior manager or they might talk to HR or they might talk to uh, an ethics or compliance officer. So a number of outlets, all of those um, are largely speaking within the standard channels. Now, if we go to whistleblowing itself, then I think that normally involves <clears throat> when someone wants to raise an issue confidentially, perhaps anonymously, because they feel that the typical channels so far haven't dealt with it, uh, often it will, it will require some form of externality to the normal man channels of management. And I suppose in the extreme, it can involve going outside the organization completely. That's kind of nuclear option where you feel everything the organization has offered you, whether your ordinary line managers or say a whistleblowing hotline has not worked. But let, for the most part, we're going to be talking today about speaking up and whistleblowing, including a, a good whistleblowing platform or hotline, all of which are <clears throat> within the organization in some sense with the whistleblowing hotline providing a necessary uh, form of externality. So whistleblowing involves someone within a business or firm or organization bringing to wider attention information which isn't currently in the public domain, where public domain might be right across the organization, not necessarily outside it, about illegal or immoral activity via a route which is outside the normal chains of management, with the goal of acting in the wider interests of the organization. I've put there with the goal of acting in the public interests. So the wider interests of the organization might include uh, how the organization is dealing with its stakeholders, whether it's its clients, its customers, its suppliers, and so on. And the intention of the person speaking up is that the problem be resolved. So the intention is a positive one. It's not just to shame, name and shame, but it's, it's done with the aim of moving the organization forward or bringing the organization back to its stated values and purposes, if you like. So that's whistleblowing. Uh, and as I say, I see it as a, on a continuum with, with other forms of speaking up. I completely agree, Chris, and I think, you know, it's so important uh, that organizations recognize that very early on, because in my experience, there's no observed misconduct that doesn't get reported. Um, it just depends on which channel the, the whistleblower chooses. Is it, you know, just being going to be recounted over a beer in the pub, um, uh, maybe discussed at the dinner table, maybe then, you know, carried on into the organization or even outside the organization, worst case scenario to the authorities before the organization has the ability to address this. But um, I wanted to move on and ask you specifically in your experiences um, and also as a philosopher, 
what are the ethical issues related to the act of speaking up and whistleblowing? Okay, great. So there's, a, I mean, there's a whole cluster of ethical issues that this topic of speaking up and whistleblowing raises. And I'm going to put up some quotes here from uh, another philosopher, Tom Morris, who wrote a book called If Aristotle Ran General Motors, because we can begin with um, the issue of truth. That's really right at the heart of speaking up and whistleblowing, truthfulness, honesty. What uh, he says in the first of those quotes is one of the most ennobling gestures we can make to any human being is to ask uh, what she thinks about what we're doing together. We should cultivate an environment in which people are not afraid to tell us the truth, even hard truths. So that obviously speaking up and whistleblowing are very much about truthfulness, about being in an environment that cares about truth. Uh, and that is important because that in turn involves pl implies placing a certain value on the people around us. It implies respect for them because all of us, as human beings, care about truth. We want other people to speak truth to us. We want to be able to speak truth, and we want to work in places where our voice, speaking truth as we see it, is heard. And it's important for generating uh, such a, a spirit of cooperation because truthfulness is critical to trust. So we want to live in an organisation where we can speak up because that is part of a trusting organisation. A trusting organisation depends on people speaking truthfully and people will only speak truthfully if they feel their voices can be heard. And uh, another ethical issue to add into it is the issue of confidentiality. When we raise concerns through speaking up or whistleblowing, even in the even in the simplest instance, say, so where I say I speak to my line manager, um, I expect initially that what I say will be treated confidentially while the organisation thinks what is done with it, because it's a serious thing to speak up. So I need to be, I need to be um, assured or feel assured that my organisation respects my confidentiality initially. And that can, if I, if I escalate the matter, can involve also respecting uh, anonymity. Both confidentiality and anonymity can be important for, um, for, for people speaking up and, and whistleblowing, for them to feel that they can tell the truth, even if it's a hard truth, without uh, an immediate kickback from other part, those parts of the organisation whose, whose behaviour is being highlighted by what they have to say. But whistleblowing and speaking up also raises issues of loyalty as well, because in various ways, um, obviously organisations expect uh, a degree of loyalty from their employees, loyalty to the purposes, to the goals of the organisation, loyalty to their fellow workers and so on. And when you speak up against uh, a part of the organisation, talk about where things are going wrong, um, loyalty kind of cuts in two ways there. On the one hand, those who are spoken against or the parts of the organisation that are criticised may well feel that their colleagues, someone in the organisation, is being disloyal to them. They may see that as an act of disloyalty. Uh, but on the other hand, you may feel that it's about um, you, if you're the whistleblower or the speaker-upper, may feel that you are actually being loyal to the values of the organisation, that you're actually being loyal to your colleagues because you're helping to steer them better towards the avowed purposes of the organisation. A few more ethical issues raised here. Whistleblowing and, uh, and speaking up uh, raises the issues of courage, because we have to bear in mind that when people speak up, they often have to have courage in doing that. And also, it may raise the issues of courage on behalf of those how those who are criticised deal with it. It may be it requires bravery to respond positively when you've been criticised. It's quite difficult to be told that you're doing things wrong and not 
uh, immediately feel the impulse to kick back against that, but to actually hear what people are saying and think about it and respond positively. It doesn't necessarily mean endorsing what they're saying, but it does mean not simply dismissing criticism out of hand. There's also a question of the best interests, the public interest. That's about the, the motives of the person speaking up. It should be done, as we saw, as, as we said before, to, to solve a problem. It should be done from the point of view of the best interests of the organization as a whole, potentially of clients or of customers or of suppliers, if you think the organization is not dealing well with them, but, or even in some cases with the public interest, if it's a very large organization, perhaps a defense organization, which is playing a significant role in the public domain as a whole, you might think that speaking up is important for the public interest. There's also the person's self-interest. Uh, when you speak up, um, it's challenging, as I've already said. It requires courage. It may harm your own self-interest. If it's not handled well, uh, you may be put, become vulnerable, vulnerable to the criticisms of others, vulnerable to the behaviours of those who feel criticised. And that may in turn also affect others who depend on you, potentially your family, your children, and so on. So there's a lot of self-interest here. There's also the issue of integrity around whistleblowing and speaking up. Because when someone speaks up, they think that they are standing up for values that their organization purports to uphold and which they perhaps join the organization because of, because of those values. And so when they're speaking up, they, there's a matter of their own integrity, standing up for what they believe in, also the integrity of the organization, because they're claiming that the organization has advertised itself as having certain values, as believing in certain things, but that it's deviating from them. And that's why they're whistleblowing. So integrity is in there as well. Then there's fairness and justice, nearly finished. <laughs> there's a long list of ethical matters. Fairness and justice because of the, of the complexity of the process of dealing with this, uh, these claims. You need to be fair to the people who speak up but you also need to be fair to those who are criticised or parts of the organisation who are criticised. So the, the way in which the organisation deals with any speaking up is a mark of whether it's, a fair or just, it's fair or just in its processes. And all of this, as I say, um, all of this in, in, in some ways in the end is about respect for individuals, the important, which is absolutely at the heart of ethical behaviour. Uh, when you behave ethically, you respect others around you. And as I've said at the beginning, one of the most, one of the key things about respecting people is res is is hearing their, allowing their voices to be heard, because truth matters so much to all of us. The feeling that we have a voice that can be heard is very important, not just in our private lives, but crucially in our in our work workplace lives. So that's a long list of ethical issues, but it's a it's a big it's a big knotty matter. Yes, I think it's um, especially in in my work that I've done with corporates, I've seen it can be very very difficult both for the the organisation to embrace the opportunity to listen um, and address the the issues that the whistleblower has shared, and at the same time. Um, give the, the whistleblower the environment that they can find the courage to speak up in the channels most opportune to the organization. One of the things that comes up um, a lot here in mainland Europe is you know, where we potentially have a bit of a, an ethical dilemma with um, some of the, the, the ways that the United States and I think maybe also the United Kingdom see whistleblowing and are incentivizing whistleblowing by, for example, rewarding whistleblowers. What are your thoughts on um, incentivizing whistleblowers? Um, good. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure about uh, paying bonuses for it, um, but I do think that it needs to be made clear within the organisation that um, speaking up when things are going wrong, if, or whistleblowing when things are going wrong, is an expected part of good working practice um, 
and that it's not uh, it's not seen as um, as um, snitching or speaking out of turn. Um, it's part of a culture in which an organisation learns and learns to do better, and uh, as such, it uh, yeah, it's an important part of working practice. It reflects the fact that the employees take the values of their organisation seriously. Um, in some professional bodies, uh, it's part of their ethical code, not just to uphold the code them, the, 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 themselves, but to speak up if you see the code broken. So it's a professional for, for something like the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, for example, it's a, it's a requirement of them as a professional. And as I say, I think in a similar way, organisations can spell out that it's an expectation of good work Obviously, you hope it, it, it won't be necessary. Uh, it's not something we want to encourage in the sense that people have to be looking to do it all the time. We'd hope it's, it's, not, it's not necessary. Uh, but if we have an open culture, then that will enable staff to speak up when they need to, and we need to make clear that that's, that's expected. I think that's a really important point that you um, raised, Chris, around culture. Uh, and I know that some of the questions in the chat um, that we will be going on into the Q&A at the end of the session in a bit more detail have been coming up around this uh, as well. But how can the right culture accommodate speaking up um, and at the same time um, retain the trust and treating all employees fairly? I mean, that's a really high bar. Yeah, quite. Um, so uh, it, it, that, that's why this issue requires really a lot of careful thought in, in an organisation. But the right culture is absolutely crucial. And we can see that from um, so many cases where people have known what was going on, but no one spoke up because speaking up wasn't the way, thing, the way things are done around here. Um, I was involved in the Leveson inquiry years ago into the media in this country. That was a case where many people knew what was going wrong in the media, but no one was speaking up. We had cases in medicine, Bristol, uh, Bristol, the Bristol Hospital, Children's Hospital, Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool, Midstaff's Hospital. In all those cases, a lot of people knew what was going wrong, but did not speak up. We've recently had in the UK... Uh, issues in the police of sexual harassment being widely known about, but nobody spoke up. Engineering emissions uh, issues have arisen where many engineers actually were aware of a problem, but no one spoke up. Civil engineering, we had a tragedy uh, recently in a housing block in London in the UK where many engineers knew there were problems, but didn't speak up because they thought it was a problem for other engineering professionals, not their profession. So uh, we need a culture in an organisation where people understand that truth-telling is valued. And that's what, what we've already referred to as an open culture. Years ago, we did a, a report for the Institute of Chartered Accountants for England and Wales on integrity in organisations and the top three things about a, 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 an organisation with integrity were tone from the top, a code of values, and an open culture. So we need an open culture where people can know that they can speak the truth and be respected for doing so. Uh, we need uh, the right tone from the top. We need the right leadership, which emphasises that if things are going wrong, the end the organization wants to hear it, that this is part of an organization improving, learning, that there's a positive value placed on speaking up. And as I say, I think that's probably best done by just making clear it's an expectation of employees rather than necessarily that you get bonuses for doing it. Making clear that, that it's not about snitching when you speak up. It's not about, um, uh, it's not a malicious thing to do. Uh, and as I say, it's a key part of the organisation striving to do what it can, the best it can. It's uh, so within this, when you talk about how do you retain trust and how do you uh, retain deal with it uh, or retain fairness and justice in the treatment of all employees, well, the process by which 
any speaking up is dealt with is going to be critical. Employees need to know, both those who speak up and those who are criticised, need to know that that process is fair, that it hears both the criticism and the response of those criticised, uh, and that the purpose of the inquiry is not, is not in the first, not primarily to punish, but to learn. Um, and it needs to know that the people involved in carrying out the process um, are scrupulous, uh, scrupulously fair in, in the way they do it. And in terms of, of trust, I think um, that again is, is, is about people understanding the purposes of an open culture, that an open culture is one in which we can learn when we're doing things wrong. And it's not about one in which we are calling people out for the sake of shaming them. It's a one where we're trying to help us all do better. It obviously is, a, it is challenging, uh, the, 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 the relationship between allowing people to speak truthfully and everybody trusting everybody else and everybody feeling a strength, sense of loyalty. So it needs handling with, with care and being aware of those challenges. Um, the last thing, which I perhaps should have said maybe even first, is it's really crucial within uh, a good culture for this, that the company has a clear set of expectations. Uh, it's clear, it has a clear code of ethics, a clear statement of its values and purposes. And it's not just, and these things are not just written down, not even just plastered up on, in big letters uh, as you go into the building. They are actually things that people talk about and understand, so they know what the code of ethics means they know what the values mean in practice and that they really understand therefore what's expected them of them so that when people speak up they are clear about what they're appealing to in doing so and those who are criticized are also clear that the what's been said is not just arbitrary but a criticism made against a shared background which they all know about as employees, because there is a lived code of ethics, a lived set of values in the organisation. So all that really, it's easy to say, I should say, but it's difficult. And I've been, you know, I've been a, a, a director of a centre and I've had issues raised and it, it's uh, challenging. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's um, there are two key elements that you've mentioned here. One is around processing the the hint that the whistleblower has issued and maintaining the integrity um, of the speak up, and at the same time um, creating that culture of safety um, where really that has really embedded throughout an organization through their values, and it's not so much. Or, or not only the how they do their business, um, uh, sorry, I'm doing not so much the what they're doing in terms of business, but how they perform their daily um, duties and activities and have a, a holistic approach to it. Um, if we're talking about creating an uh, organizational culture, how important is the tone from the top and the behaviors and attitudes of the leaders in that organization? Yeah, I think it, uh, that, that's uh, um, very important. Um, uh, there was a, a, a case a few years ago where um, someone uh, raised a serious matter in a in a UK financial institution, uh, which was officially committed to an open culture and speaking up and whistleblowing. And the organisational response was for the senior leader to try to hunt down and uncover who it was who had raised the question. So in other words, to um, get rid of their anonymity. Um, so, I mean, what lead leaders need to make clear that they are open, as the quote from Don Morris says, to hearing even hard truths. And notoriously, organizations are good at hearing uh, what people have to say when it's laudatory, or encouraging, praising, but um, not good at hearing those the, the 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 hearing from those who are conveying bad news, and it's not just a matter of what leaders say. So it's not just a matter of them say circulating questionnaires saying we want to hear from you. 
It's a matter of their day in, day out behavior and how they model a listening culture. Uh, in every engagement, whether you get the sense that when you are engaging with the leaders, they actually are listening to you, hearing you, not just when you're raising criticisms, but all the time. And it's a matter of staff feeling that when, po points, when points are raised, people act on them as well. So very much the, you need to be, the, the leaders need to be feeding back uh, in ways which reveal how they, as well as the organisation as a whole, have responded to issues raised. So it's behaviour as well as, it's actions as well as words. Uh, I agree. I think that's so so very important. And I think um, as an organization, that's often where the supporting functions, HR, legal uh, and compliance are very important to give the leaders the, the right tools so that they um, are able to fulfill that role. Um, we're, we're now, I think we have another five minutes, Chris, before we hand over to Phil. And I would just like us to, to also think about... Um, what about if you're an object of speaking up? How, how do you, does the organization respond to that situation? Okay, I'll, uh, I just want to say one thing which will no doubt feed into to what Phil said about culture and how um, whistleblowing is processed. Um, and that is the importance of closure. Um, I've, I've perhaps touched on it, but um, it's very important that when an issue is raised, uh, what is reported doesn't disappear into a void. There must be a process that's not just fair and just, but also has a clear, um, a clear sense of, uh, of, of closure, of, of um, finishing what has been begun by the person raising the issue. So you must be able to see, as the whistleblower, uh, what has, uh, what the way... Uh, what has been revealed has been dealt with. So, sorry, I should have, uh, I think that's another key part of the culture and the process. And I'm sure Phil's going to say a bit more about that. Um, as to the way the person who's the object has been criticised, I think that um, uh, it's important the organisation has uh, empathy uh, for that. It isn't pleasant to be on the receiving end of criticisms. And it's fine to say we're an open culture and we want to hear from you if things are wrong, but uh, we need to recognize that whenever someone says something's wrong, somebody or some set of people are being said to have failed in some way. And that's, that's not nice. Um, gen often, um, it won't be necessarily being said that people have deliberately failed, uh, but um, it will be nonetheless culpable negligence or blameworthy oversights that are being raised. So uh, there needs to be support, fair support, for someone who's criticised. Uh, there needs to be pastoral processes or HR processes in place to allow those people to move forward and to allow them to see that as a developmental issue, even though sometimes it can be hard for them as well as for the organisation. So I think it's really important that the person who's, who, the, the, as well as thinking about the, the whistleblower and treating them fairly, it's really important that those who are criticised are not forgotten and given just the same degree of attention and care. Obviously, sometimes the whistleblower will be calling out something which genuinely is really bad and then there will be issues of punishment and so on. But in the first instance, there needs to be a degree of empathy from the person criticised as well. Absolutely. I think it's very important also for the integrity of the investigation that also the subject of the investigation gets protected in the same manner. Exactly. Um, I, I, I think we're at time now, so I would um, hand over to Phil before we then all meet back up in the, the Q&A. Thanks very much, Julia. And there's a end of my slides. <laughs> I 
Okay. Um, sorry about that. I was just trying to find my play. So, um, kind of, I've got to say, I thought that was absolutely fascinating um, and really insightful from the, from Chris and Julia. So, it hopefully, will segue into into um, my part of the presentation, which carries on from from um, Chris's presentation, but hopefully, will give you. a Bit of an insight in terms of some of the practicalities as well so um my first the first point was just to provide you some hopefully some interesting stuff um and looking at historical context so whistleblowing goes as far back as 1773 probably further um benjamin franklin here on the left was one of the founding fathers of the us um and is possibly one of the first whistleblowers. Um, he revealed information. And in fact, sorry, I think, um, if I go back a slide, I think of, no, I haven't. Um, I did have an agenda there. Um, uh, he revealed information which exposed the governor of Massachusetts for acting improperly in an attempt to promote, to promote a, a military build up. In 1777, during the Revolutionary War, two naval officers blew the whistle on the torturing of a of British prisoners of war by Commodore Isaac Hopkins, who's pictured here on the right, um, who was the commander in chief of the Continental Navy. As a result, the Continental Congress enacted the Whistleblower Protection Law um, in 1778. And in addition to that, it declared that the United States would defend the two naval officers against the libel suit filed against them by Hopkins. So, Hello, my introduction for me. So I'm Thulius Chemsky and I've been investigating fraud and serious crimes for many years um, within law enforcement and um, more recently within the corporate, corporate organisations world with, within Virgin Media uh, and now with Three. So I manage Three's whistleblowing service and appreciate that this is a very sensitive, complex subject matter. However, when handled in the right way, and what I mean by this is with the support from senior management, a shift in culture and the right messaging, whistleblowing, or perhaps more appropriately defined as empowering people to raise concerns in confidence, is a tool that can provide a positive balance of promoting the right culture within an organisation and stimulates a healthy working environment. So my father, he was a Polish migrant who, after the Second World War, came to live in Britain. Um, here he met my mother, and as nature takes its course, my sister and I came along. Stay with me on this. As we grew up, we had the typical sibling rivalry with squabbles and fights, but we lived in an environment knowing that there were rules and that we crossed them at our peril. Nevertheless, I knew that if things did go wrong, I could speak to my parents and, and had their support. There were unwritten rules at home, I guess you could call it um, a grievance policy of what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable. Staying out late, scrumping, answering back, not doing homework, I could go on, but you get the idea. I knew what would happen if I didn't stick to those rules. Often and unknowingly, they were discussed over dinner with questions such as, what did I do at school that day? How were my friends? But we had a safe and secure environment to have those conversations. I guess in the workplace, you'd call that communication and trust. Fast forward to adulthood, to adulthood um, I spent a number of years handling police informants, um, chizzes as, as, as they're called now, uh, grasses, snitch, snitches, call them what you will, but you've all heard the terms. Most of these were blowing the whistle on the criminal underworld. Their motivation varied. Seeking to remove their competition, financial gain, giving themselves a sense of entitlement, allowing them to commit crimes whilst informing. And if all went wrong, it's been known for them to give evidence against their trusted friends for a lesser sentence. There is no honour amongst thieves. And the consequences from them blowing the whistle? Well, you can see there, three of Scotland Yard's most valued informants have believed to be murdered by professional hitmen. 
by the underworld. It's pretty shocking stuff, but I want to reassure you that we're not looking at that. So how do police informants link into whistleblowing? Well, quite simply, they don't. Um, whistleblowers in the workplace are a million miles away uh, from the criminal underworld. They're not grasses, they're not snitches. They are individuals speaking up about things that are not right. And companies need people who are willing to speak up and they need to provide an embedded culture and framework that provides support for the whistleblower. So looking at, very briefly, etymology, whistleblower. So US civil activist Ralph Nader on the left here is said to have coined the word whistleblower in the early 1970s in order to avoid the negative connotations found in other words, such as informer and snitch. However, the origins of the word date back to the 19th century where law enforcement officials used a whistle to alert the public or fellow police about such problems as the commission of a crime or imminent danger. So the following slides are considerations that I faced on a similar journey at three, engaging multiple functions and individuals to have the right platform for our, our employees to raise a concern. And the question is, do I need a whistleblowing service? Press too quickly. So the answer to that is no, but it depends. Um, EU organisations are required to have a whistleblowing service as part of their directive. Um, within the European Parliament, commonly known as the EU Whistleblower Directive, um, and that requires member states to create laws, etc. However, since Brexit, we are no longer part of the EU and therefore don't fall within this relatively new directive. But whilst in the UK for many organisations there's no obligation to have a whistleblowing service, you are if you're a financial institution or under FCA regulation. So you're saying, so I say no, but why do I still need one then? So one of the drivers for requiring a whistleblower service falls within the Bribery Act of 2010. Without overcomplicating the detail, I've taken some of the key points that are relevant. Section 7 of the Act creates a new form of corporate liability for failing to prevent bribery. The good news, though, for you is that the Act recognises that no bribery prevention regime is capable of preventing bribery at all times. So Section 7 provides a full defence. But where it can be shown that adequate procedures have been put in place. And taking a look at what those adequate procedures are, there are two main principles. There are six, but the two that I've pulled out are around principle one, which is proportionate procedures. And that's the reporting of bribery to include speaking up or whistleblowing. Principle two, and that's having that top level commitment that Chris talked about and an, org an organisation has or is putting in place, including any protection and procedures for confidential reporting of bribery, whistleblowing. So taking this into account, can you say that you have adequate procedures in place? Take a look outside of the Bribery Act, there are also a number of additional points to cover. I'm not sure I'll be able to comprehensively address all of the reasons why you should have one, but I've considered a number of key elements. Fraud and visibility. Are you confident that your employees feel comfortable reporting fraud? Does your culture encourage this? Are you seeing the true picture from your staff about concerns within the workplace? Are you suffering losses but don't know how? Your brand damage, huge. Would reputational damage be recoverable for you? Would you be able to grow trust amongst your employees? third parties, new customers? Are you confident within escalation and control that your concerns are being escalated within your company and are being dealt with? Or are your controls or lack of them causing issues with morale, churn, negative internal surveys, or employees reporting externally, including the media? Are you aware? Do you even know if things are getting out of control? Would you be aware of a major risk that could have been otherwise controlled or mitigated? So, if we move on, what are the benefits of having a whistleblowing option in your company? 
So it demonstrates that you look after your employees. You're creating that right culture amongst your staff and third parties and customers. You're operating with the confidence of knowing that everyone is looking after your organization. And when it goes wrong, there is a clear mechanism to address issues quickly and confidentially. Will it help your bottom line, your return on investments, business culture, working environment, engaged staff? Highly likely. There are also other considerations. Helping combat fraud, encouraging people to speak up and expose wrongdoing is a major factor in fighting fraud, corruption and unethical behaviour. The mere presence of a whistleblowing system may be enough to put people off committing any illeg illegitimate activity. It avoids reputational damage when an issue is raised through internal channels. It allows the, your departments to take charge and tackle it appropriately as well as discreetly. More crucially, an anonymous system helps someone who doesn't feel safe or confident sharing information with their employer to come forward. If there isn't an internal solution, they may choose to take that information elsewhere or disclose it publicly, potentially damaging your company's reputation. Whistleblowing prevents escalation. One of the greatest benefits of whistleblowing in an organisation is that it provides the opportunity to catch problems early on. When the information is shared directly with your dedicated team, the company can deal with the concern immediately before it escalates, potentially preventing serious harm or damage. And removing risks early also means a company can focus on what's really important. Losses. Reducing losses. So when illegitimate activities are reported, it allows your company to tackle problems quickly, as well as prevent it from happening again in the future. In this way, Companies avoid painful losses, which are damaging for everyone, from employees to clients and suppliers. Awareness. Without whistleblowers, we may be unaware of illegal, illegal or unethical things happening under our noses. The information they pass on, no matter the degree of severity or the nature of it, can raise awareness of issues and concerns within, within your organisation that need to be addressed. With such knowledge in hand, a company can learn, grow and flourish. And this is why a proper whistleblowing system is essential to managing breaches in a quick and constructive way. Culture, that's a huge thing that we've talked about. And a company that shows it actively encourages employees to report concerns and supports them if they do so will gain more trust. An open and honest culture usually creates better working relationships and dedication resulting in higher productivity. Less staff turnover and provides confidence to shareholders and third parties. Furthermore, employees are more likely to make an internal report rather than disclose information externally, which leads us back to the reasons mentioned previously of why it benefits an organisation to provide a whistleblowing channel for its employees. Considerations for implementation. I mean, this is a big subject, really, but... I've tried to condense it into um, some key key areas. And it's looking at, so what are your company's priorities for a whistleblowing service? Why do you actually need one? And taking all of the points into consideration, that will hopefully help you. It's worth considering your musts have, your must haves and your nice to haves. An early engagement with your key, sto key stakeholders throughout the whole process. And this is, we've included, we've talked, or, Chris has talked about our legal departments, our training, our policy writers, our data protection teams, compliance, procurement, regulatory, and the list could go on. And you, you know your own, who your own stakeholders are, but these are the people that need to be engaged throughout the process. Share your wish list, wish list with your vendors. Can they provide you with what you need? Can they offer alternative solutions? Will they work with you during the implementation phase? Do I have the right policies in place? What policies will I need? What will it need to contain? And do I have the commitment from the top? Communication, so communication to all of your employees. What's happening? Why is it happening? How is it going to be implemented? And where are the policies and guidance how to support them through this journey? And then training of staff, e-learning modules. Like I said, the list, the list can can go on.
One of the main purposes for having a whistleblowing platform is to provide confidence to your employees that concerns in the workplace provided in confidence are done so without fear of retaliation, reprimand or retribution. These can include discrimination, fraudulent activity or safeguarding issues. Employees that raise such concerns have legal protection from dismissal or from being disadvantaged in some way because they blew the whistle. Chris mentioned it earlier about senior managers trying to identify who those um, whistleblowers were. If a whistleblower believes that they've been dismissed or disadvantaged following the concern they raised, they can bring a claim to an employment tribunal. If they win, there's no cap on the amount of compensation that can be awarded to them. But there are other more significant consequences of failing to take whistleblowing concerns seriously or delaying taking appropriate action. And with this in mind, is your business set up when you receive that bombshell of an allegation from one of your employees? What will it do if the local, or what would you do if the local or national press ask you for comment about your company that you weren't aware of? And what's your plan? Listening to concerns raised can quickly identify failures without causing any damage. This could save you hundreds, tens of thousands of pounds, prevent significant media scrutiny, and in some sectors, even save lives. It provides you control. So looking at some of the stuff in the news. So a Barclays chief executive was recently fined nearly 650,000 pounds by the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulator Authority for breaching rules when he tried to identify a whistleblower. As a result, Barclays share price suffered as a consequence and its reputation was tarnished. And the bank will also have to report annually to the regulators detailing how it handles whistleblowing after they express concerns about its existing systems. So in other sectors, schools, education. I mean, this is just one of, of many that that I found just doing a quick, um, a quick Google search. And if you look, in, look here, what, what this really actually means is, is that the whistleblower did blow the whistle. They spoke to Ofsted, they spoke to the school's trust, but nothing was done. It was, it was essentially ignored. So they went to the Manchester Evening News um, to blow the whistle. And this is just one of, one of many cases where companies don't investigate, don't take whistleblowing seriously, and it leaves staff with no alternative but to go elsewhere to make a, an allegation or a report of a concern. Transparency International, who's the, the UK's leading independent um, anti-corruption organisation, um, reported Wirecard that collapsed in 2020 after 1.9 billion euros in its balance sheet could not be accounted for. Effective internal whistleblowing systems can help organisations to avoid dark consequences directly from Transparency International. So we could also look, we could also talk about where unchallenged, unchallenged behaviours, poor culture, lack of control mechanisms can have a detrimental impact on large public and private sectors. And where public employee trust is broken and needs fixing, this this is condensed. But I've mentioned there are law enforcement issues, as Chris mentioned early, earlier. The healthcare system, the banking sector, just to name but a few. Effective internal whistleblowing systems can help organisations to avoid dire consequences such as fatalities, environmental damage, and repercussions for business and the, pub and the public purse. And whistleblowing is one of the most effective ways to uncover corruption, fraud, mismanagement, and other wrongdoing. Moreover, organisations are often best placed to deal with wrongdoing occurring within their own remit. So preventing the complaint from becoming a crisis, the objective should be to prevent the complaint before becoming a crisis. The best advice to avoid this crisis is by decision-making, by preparing in advance 
for the complaints we are know are coming, ensuring that there is a robust escalation process, even if it rules individuals out as whistleblowers. All cases are logged appropriately in actions, and that the basic procedures for conducting a methodical internal investigation can be carried out, even if staff are working remotely or working in retail or working in different parts of your business. Assess and balance all the risks arising as a result of any whistleblower coming forward, including not just the company's reputational risk, but any civil, criminal, regulatory or employment risk. Financial service firms regulated by the FCA will need to give particular consideration to the FCA rules on systems and controls to ensure the proper assessment of whistleblowing and the protection of whistleblowers are followed. But the most important protection for managing legal and reputation risks is hearing employees' concerns in a timely manner, providing them with a safe and trustworthy mechanism to bring their issues to the attention of management and considering and addressing as well as where necessary, investigating those concerns, both big and small. And there's plenty of commotion demanding our attention. Make sure you can hear the whistle through the noise. Thank you. And that was my final slide. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Have you got a poll to do, Phil, or are you happy to move on? Yeah, I think the poll was uh, it was a continuation from right. the initial. Yeah, so uh, but I think basically after hearing the discussion, do you still think your organisational culture makes it easy or or makes it easy or facilitates speaking up? Perfect. Grand. Okay, thank you. So it looks like we've actually got quite a few questions come in, which is really positive. Um, so I'll just kick off a few. Um, one of the questions that's come in is, I would say, perhaps um, for everyone involved. So I'll put this out to the panel. So the first question we have is, so often we place the emphasis on people using their voice and speaking up, but leaders don't know how to respond to concerns resistance, uh, denial, or even ignoring. Um, this leads to a breakdown in trust. So what are the panel's views on this and the impact on corporate integrity? So I don't know if uh, anybody wants to jump on that. Chris, do you want to? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. I mean, I think that... Um... So one of the questions is, one of the issues here is about uh, what are the attributes of good leadership? And um, we talk about leaders needing to have vision and uh, needing to have a, a to, to, to drive the, uh, to drive the organization forward. But one of the things that we talked about earlier in, when I was discussing with Julia was the importance of listening. Um, so, Part of the question is what is is that the leaders have, as Tracy says, people can use their voice and speak up, but it's no good if you're if you're just ignored. Um, what does listening come to? Uh, well, this may connect to another issue, which is about um, the extent to which an organisation is hierarchical. Um, I think that, and also a question of who's identified as leaders. So I don't think that uh, a culture of listening is simply a question of uh, employees expecting the managing director, as it were, to hear what they say when they speak up and immediately respond. What you need is a listening organisation all the way through, which means people identify as leaders at multiple levels in the organization and <clears throat> uh, at each of those levels you want people to listen so if you first raise a question with your line manager you want the sense that one of the attributes your line manager has is someone who listens if you raise a question 
further up the organization you want this thing to happen there so i think that there's a question about the extent to which an organization is hierarchical and the extent to which people right at the top insulate themselves and there's a question about the extent to which uh, the culture of the organization embeds itself through everybody who's in any kind of leadership role throughout the organization recognizing that it's incumbent on them when things are raised to hear them seriously and not brush them under the table. Mm. I think, thanks, that, Chris, I, I totally, yeah, totally agree. And I think it is a, a really good question. And I think from my, my perspective, just getting into, the, into the, the granular detail, it's about ensuring that you've got appropriately qualified individuals that can also manage and handle the um, the initial allegations as well. So if you're looking at, you know, leaders that don't know how to respond to concerns, well, you know, you, you, an organisation needs to appoint the right people in the first instance that can actually know how to manage the concern, where the concern and how it needs to be dealt with across the organisation. Um, but that's, to be, that's backed up with having the right policies in place, the right communication in place for the staff as well, so that, that staff are aware of what they're, um, what, what their expectations are for, for communication um, and that an organisation is communicating to staff with what expectations there are when they are actually receiving um, a complaint as such. But I think if it was, I think the most important element is to make sure that you've got the right people managing whistleblowing so that they are triaging and they are escalating and there are robust um, escalation paths to make sure that the right people are actually supporting that particular investigation. So it removes resistance. It doesn't, it isn't down to an individual that actually denies um, the, the allegation or refuses to take the complaint further. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a case that can't be ignored. And I think with ensuring you've got those robust um, policies and processes in place, um, an incident shouldn't be ignored, um, an incident shouldn't be denied, and, and, they, and the culture should be embedded within the organisation that there won't be resistance to an investigation. So, yeah, that would be my, my answer to follow on from you, Chris. Yeah, good. So it's not just about the leaders, it's also as you, but about the processes as well that are embedded in the organization. That's, that, that makes good sense to me. Phil. Yeah. I, I would also add to this, and I don't know why my camera is not working. I apologize for that. But um, it's not, not only about the policies and procedures um, uh, and the individual leaders, but it's then also that everything works together appropriately. Whistleblowing is such a multidisciplinary um, topic within an organization where you need compliance to work with HR, to work with whatever the investigative body is, might be um, audit, might be a special dedicated body that does the investigations, um, might be external um, attorneys that get pulled in, as well as individuals that are um, subject of the investigation. So it's a hugely complicated um, uh, and tricky issue for, for organizations to, to manage. And as you mentioned, Phil, it's super, super important that the leaders are appropriately trained and educated in that way. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Absolutely. I think one of my slides actually references um, an organization that did exactly that, you know, chose to ignore um, a, an actual issue. And then I think it was about three years later, it came to light, I think it was WordPress, an, an incident came to light that there was there, there was a complaint, there was an allegation made. I think it was in 2016, and in 2019, um, when the investigation actually kicked off, it uncovered a whole heap of stuff that that basically closed the whole company down. So, uh, perfect. Thank you for the question. Uh, we've got another one here. So, what is the most effective way? to create the environment of psychological safety required to facilitate speak up. Um, I'm going to pass that one over to you, Phil. Um, oh, no, I did say this, didn't I? So, so what's the most effective way to create an environment of psychological safety 
required to speak up. I guess it's there's a need to look into in, need to look deeply into the culture and, and makeup of the organisation. Um, you know, is there a, is there a positive framework of expected behaviours that's embedded within that organisation? Is there a right you know is the right culture in there? Um, are there clear, defined, and I do I use the word policies quite quite a lot, but I think it's really important. Are there clear, defined policies of what's acceptable and, and what isn't acceptable? Um, are the company values communicated regularly? Are employees following those company values? Um, is there a whistleblowing policy? Um, also, are the policies behind that? Um, looking at grievances and raising a concern. Are there, is there the right framework within an organisation that's supporting the, psycholog the psychological safety of, of, of the whistleblower that actually wants to raise a concern? How will the organisation protect them? Is that clearly communicated? Is it documented? Are they given the right level of information about what support, um, what journey they'll be taken through if they, you know, if they are raising a concern at work? Um, is there an outlet where you can raise a concern confidentially, anonymously, um, or you know what? What is the framework? What's the what's the expectation of an organisation? Is an organisation providing um, an individual with that level of security, um, so that, you know they have got the right mindset? They know that they can actually discuss something um, in confidence. Um, and yeah, I just I, I did write another note there. How you know does that person know how they will be protected through that journey as well? And it's all of that framework that, that creates that level of safety, the level of security, um, knowing that the, the culturally an organisation will would support them. Um, yeah. Thanks. Another thing, yeah, yeah, another thing that um, you mentioned in your uh, presentation, Phil, was actually a Bar uh, the Barclays, in the Barclays case that they were required to report on how they deal with whistleblowing cases. So if you're an employee and you can see uh, and, and, and you can see how whistleblowing has been dealt with in the past and you get a clear sense that the organisation has taken things seriously and done dealt with it in a fair and judicious way that again is another way of giving confidence these things are obviously tricky because sometimes the issues that are raised by whistleblowers organizations may not want to ventilate widely but nonetheless uh, showing at the end of the year or reporting at the end of the, on a yearly basis as to how issues that have been raised and spoken up I mean again uh, have been have been dealt with and actually to put it into a positive context showing that how that has helped the organization to improve um i i really think it's quite important that organizations think about speaking up and whistleblowing as methods for improvement as methods for learning it's easy to think about them as all about blame and finding fault and so on but really uh as i, as I said at the beginning a, a well-meaning whistleblower should intend to raise issues so that the problem can be resolved and the organization can move move forward so trying to embed this as part of a positive culture of improvement and learning i think is also important in helping people um, with this challenging thing raised by the question of of feeling uh, psychologically safe in doing what they're doing it's much easier to do that if you think you're involved in a positive circle of improvement and doing things better. Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. So this next question is actually quite a recurring one that, that um, we have at EQS as well. Um, so this again, open forum. I might start with you again, Chris. So as we say, it's a serious matter to raise your voice. Hence, a need to be anonymous is needed for the whistleblower. But isn't there also a risk that a whistleblower may come with intentional um, wrong accusations, especially if they can rem remain anonymous? So as I say, I'll let you kick off on that, Chris. Yeah, good. And I'll be, uh, I, I will be interested to hear Phil as well on this, because, yes, it's an absolutely spot on. It's, a, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a downside of um, 
of the speaking up and whistleblowing process that it can be abused. Um, and uh, so what one wants from one's employees is not just a commitment to truth, but a commitment to a compassionate and kind and well-motivated truth um, and embedding that in the culture as well as just the importance of tr truth telling and improving the organization by speaking truth is really important and i suppose that ties into the importance of of loyalty to to one's colleagues um how does one i mean the, the, the once the once a uh, 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 someone has put in uh a query it's it's really important uh that it is uh, that the process of dealing with it is absolutely scrupulous um and it's not just because you want to find out if the organization can be improved it's also because as this says there's someone on the end of it and you need to make sure they're not being treated maliciously so i mean part of that will be having as Phil said, a policy in which it's made clear that malicious speaking up, malicious whistleblowing is itself, uh, it's a punishable, it's, a, it's, 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 it's an offence. Uh, and that people found to do that will be dealt with accordingly or fa uh, fairly, but accordingly, because what they're doing is precisely undermining the whole system. Uh, because they are using it not for the purposes it's there for. The purposes it is there for are to help the organisation improve. They're not to allow people to um, carry out grudges against others in the organisation who, for one reason or another, they don't get along with. So I think uh, scrupulous investigation, having in the culture the importance of compassionate, kind uh, well motivated speaking up and making clear that as part of the process of investigation if it's found to be malicious that will be uh, uh, that will be viewed as a punishable offense and phil can probably speak from experience about this because i'm sure he's had to deal with such things <clears throat> yeah absolutely chris you know you, you you've covered you know everything and on a and I guess the point in relation to the policy is that uh, at three within the whistleblowing policy, there's there's a, there's a clear um, section in there that covers false allegations, and that's the the, the policy covers where um, that where something that hasn't been followed in in good faith, where false and inaccurate allegations have made with malicious intent, it will be considered a serious conduct issue. Um, and would be managed in accordance with our disciplinary process. Um, but the, there's another element to it as well, that where the situation or the allegation is sufficiently serious, that you know we will or could consider civil or criminal action against an individual if they were found um, to make such allegations. So it's really clear, it's really robust. And back to your point, Chris, which is absolutely right, it's having the right and suitably trained individuals that can investigate the report because at the end of the day um, if a whistleblowing report is is received be it malicious or in good faith it still has the same lev level of integrity of investigation so it needs to have the right people in there that can can actually identify malicious complaints through um, through those given in that, that aren't malicious Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Um, I've got one here for you, Phil, I'd say. Um, what were the challenges you had to overcome to implement whistleblowing into your company, if any? Um, yeah, there were a few. <laughs> um, and I, I, it, 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 I, I, guess it, I guess it's down to the actual buy-in of your organisation, where are you start? Where are you starting from? You know, you're starting from a, a blank piece of paper where you you, you decided to I actually need one, and if you decided that you actually need one, well, what steps, what hoops do you need to go through? And I think I think some of the biggest challenges that that I faced 
um, was the engagement of the key stakeholders across the organisation, not to necessarily to convince them it was what was needed, but it was the the challenges from a, um, a procurement perspective, the due diligence, identifying vendors, um, security, considering the security of the, uh, the safety of the platform, getting another stakeholder in to review the, the security of, of, say, EQS. So, you know, we would have to, we'd have to carry out our own due diligence on, on your security. The legal elements, contracts, you know, these are things that are they, on, on the face of it, they don't sound um, big ticket items, but they're huge, you know, because you, you you, you, you're needing um, other parts of a business to support you to get a whistleblowing service, whistleblowing provider in, in, in situ. So, you know, I guess if you're looking at it right from, take it back right from the beginning, the biggest, biggest hurdles I had were, was looking at data protection, security, legal, procurement, um, budget, uh, ensuring that you've actually budgeted for um, implement the implementation of whistleblowing service, but then the other the other issues that and, and they were nice to, nice to have issues. It's the communication with your staff. Um, it's it, it's enforcing um, the positive cultural benefits of of what whistleblowing provides a company, um, and then developing a, a, a training module, developing an e-training module. So, you know, these are all considerations that you need to, to have. And because three are, are part of a reg, are part of a, a regulatory body and, and, are, and uh, their touch points with the FCA, we needed to have um, a robust e-module as well that, 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 you know, stood the test of time for some of the regulatory products that we sell. So, you know, I guess they were the, the biggest challenges that we had to face. Um, in terms of top commitment, that, that was there. You know, it it it, it, um, it was quite. I used the word it was an easy sell, but the top the top level commitment was already there in terms of building the right culture across three. Um, you know, and, and ensuring that people had people knew um, what was expected. People knew what the, people know what the standards are, and you know. So I guess the top down that was relatively easy. Um, but with all the other things that, um, or the intricacies of actually building, implementing policy writing, policy writing that that was quite a, a challenge as well. Albeit we had policy writers doing that, it's bringing everyone into the room and having that um, collaborative approach to get things over the line. Brilliant. Thanks again. Um, I'd say we've got time for perhaps one or two more. So I've got one here that um, I'd say is relevant for yourself, Chris. Um, so this individual they said they'd be interested in hearing about any differences you may have noticed or aware of related to whistleblowing or reporting in different countries. So i.e. does national culture or history have an impact, positive or negative, on whistleblowing? Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Ruf. Um, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I've certainly not done systematic uh, investigation of this, but one thing I would say, which I touched on in answering an earlier question about leaders who resist or ignore, is I do think that um, hi uh, cultural hierarchies can be one issue. And there are certainly in, in, within academia, which is my field, for example, I am aware of the fact that in some countries, uh, senior academics are on pedestals, effectively, within the organisation. And the idea that you might raise things, raise issues uh, to or about um, the structures or those people individually is, is, is difficult because they, they, that the, uh, there's a kind of hierarchical... Um, yeah, a hierarchy within within the organisation, and I think that can happen um, within organisations uh, within a country. So, I mean, I think that the editors of newspapers, for example, and the proprietors of newspapers uh, are on a kind of pedestal, and you might find a kind of hierarchical culture, perhaps uh, within medicine in the past, which has made whistleblowing uh, difficult uh, or speaking up difficult. 
I think that Phil's response to the earlier question is right, that one of the ways around this is not to put all the emphasis on leaders, but to put emphasis on having the right processes within the organisation. Of course, that doesn't leave leaders out of it, because leaders have to sign up to having those processes, appropriate processes, um, and they also undermine those processes if they don't um, if they don't set the right example. But uh, yes, you can you can start to deal with hierarchies by introducing relevant processes. Uh, and as I say, I think you can find them you, you, you can find them both within countries and uh, between different countries uh, in ways that can affect whether speaking up or whistleblowing is easy or not. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment, comment on that. I don't know if uh, Julia has any thoughts about it. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that we touched on earlier on is really to um, make sure that uh, all the, the policies and procedures that touch around this are married up together so that you then also have the relevant HR framework, for example, um, to make sure that the right incentives are being set, the right behaviors and values are being supported, um, and um, misconduct is then being addressed, and then also have the transparency that there is the right response, um, regardless of where someone is in the organization, uh, so that individuals see that things are being addressed when they're being elevated and raised. Perfect. I think that's all we've got time for. I think we've answered the majority of, of the questions. So thank you for all the questions came through. Really, really insightful. Um, so as we come to a close, I just wanted to sort of highlight the wider range of free initiatives that, that EQS can provide. So including blogs around specific topics within compliance, publications, white papers, case studies, so all of these um, can be found on our website or reach out to an EQS representative. Um, the next event we actually have, if, if it's of interest for anybody, is tomorrow, which is a joint event with Mazars Island and fraud prevention training con um, sorry, concerning the Protected Disclosures Act Amendment. So if this is of interest, then please follow the resources section and you can register there. So that's all we've got time for today. So just a quick uh, wrap up, just a reminder, we will be sharing the slides with you shortly um, and the recording. So if you do want access of any of the content um, or sign up to any of the upcoming events, you'll be able to do so via the slides. So thank you very much for joining. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the questions and thank you again to the panel. Really appreciate the speakers and your time and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.